Welcome to the Savvy Dentist Podcast with Dr. Jesse Green, the show where great dentistry meets great business. Listen in each week as we bring you an inspiring person who will share their story, ideas, and business techniques to help you create a practice and a life you love. And now introducing your host, Dr. Jesse Green. Welcome back to the Savvy Dentist Podcast, the show where great dentistry meets great business. Today, I'm super excited because we're having a conversation with Martin Grunstein, and Martin has worked with over 500 companies across more than 100 industries that has made him the country's most in-demand speaker on the subject of customer service. Now, we all understand the importance of customer service. We all get it, but sometimes translating the fact that we get it into something practical well, that can be a little bit fraught from time to time. So in our conversation today, we're going to be having a chat about practical ways to lift the game in customer service so that your patients have a fantastic experience. And of course, you've got busy books, productive books, and so on and so forth. Now, before we do get into the conversation with Martin today, uh, just a couple of public service announcements. For those of you who are new to our podcast, welcome. Uh, It's wonderful to have you here. For those who have been to our podcast before, welcome back. It's wonderful to have you here as well. For those who are not quite familiar with what we do, please do come across and find us in the Savvy Dentist Facebook group. We've got tools, we've got training, tips and tricks there for dentists to help create a practice and a life that you love. And naturally, you can also head across to your app store of choice and download the Savvy Dentist app for all uh, free resources and a bunch of cool things there for you. So Martin, welcome to the program. It's wonderful to have you here. I've been looking forward to this conversation for a very long time. How's things with you, my friend? Everything is very good. The business is strong, but the business is strong for me, unfortunately, because customer service is so poor in this country. And the ones who get it right do well and the ones who don't, uh, don't. The area of customer service and getting people to run their businesses more efficiently seems to be a perennial topic. Why is it do you think customer service is so poor in this country? Where have we dropped the ball? I tell you, I've been speaking with customer service for over 30 years now. I don't think it's any better now than it was 30 years ago. Technology may have changed to enable things to be done more immediately. The lack of, I suppose, return phone calls and the way you're treated when you walk into places, I don't think is any better now. It's really hard to it's really hard to fathom in terms of why it is. A lot of it is that either people don't care or they haven't been trained in how to deal with people, but it seems to be the gap between the haves and the have-nots just seems to be widening and widening. Yeah, it's really interesting, actually, Martin. Um, I was at a a marketing conference last week in Sydney, and it was an internet marketing conference. And you would think that that was going to be all about pay-per-click, SEO, all those sorts of cool things. And there was some of that for sure. But the topic which really landed for the audience was a thing called human-to-human marketing. And it was quite interesting to have that conversation in the internet marketing context. So it feels to me that this human-to-human marketing, even though we've got technology to make things more convenient, it doesn't replace the human touch. Look, it's very interesting. I think technology changes, but people stay the same. And that's one of the fundamentals. Interesting, I ran a session for a group in the financial service industry saying analog is the new digital. (laughs) And by that I meant digital increases immediacy, it increases demands and expectations, But what it always does is a lot of people use technology as a replacement for that human-to-human contact. And at the end of the day, uh, people need to build relationships with people in the business area, whether it be an insurance person or a dentist. So while you want technology to be an enabler, you don't want it to overrule all your communications so you lose the, the essence of the relationship you have with your clients. My experience, Martin, is that there's a real risk of becoming transactional rather than relational. And when you become transactional, that's when the big risk of commoditization occurs. You would have seen lots of industries over the years become commoditized. How is it that an industry allows itself to become commoditized in the first place? Well, I don't think it actually allows itself. It's usually the participants within the industry work on a fallback that the price or the transaction is the most important thing and they take all the focus off the value-added benefits and it focuses on the cheapest price. And what happens through competition, margins erode. And what happens is the industry, for example, you take the travel industry, which used to be about romance and excitement and travelling around the world. Well, now it's point-to-point flus on the internet. And these sort of things happen 
in a lot of industries. It's inexcusable in all industries, even more inexcusable in a personal industry, especially if you're talking about healthcare professionals around there, because fundamentally, the human focus is what the relationship is all about. It's really interesting. I understand exactly what you're saying because I've seen it so often in dentistry. And it's really interesting. I belong to various Facebook groups and you see lots of conversational threads in there. And what I find really interesting is it feels like some of the dentists feels like they have to be price takers rather than price setters. If someone wanted to transition away from being a price taker, and having to or well, feeling the need to compete on price, what would be a step or two that they could think about to actually be able to price themselves better, whether expanding their margins, making more profit? What would you think about that? The classic example from the work I've done with dentists, I've done quite a bit through ADACPD in Sydney. A lot of dentists are saying tourism for implants, yeah. for example, yeah. is eroding their margins. You know, people are saying, oh, you're going to charge $15,000, $20,000. I can get it done for $5,000 in Thailand or whatever it happens to be there, right? The unintelli- and the analogy I give is this. There was a hairdresser in a small US country town charging 25 bucks for haircuts, making a killing, never had a competitor in his life. Yep. First time ever, a salon opens across the road with a big sign on its window saying $6 haircuts and the first in trouble. He says, if I keep my price at $25, I'm going to lose a lot of my customers for these $6 haircuts. But if I drop my price till $6, I can drive this guy to business. I'll go break myself. Most people believe you either match the price or lose the sale. But what this guy did that was outstandingly successful was he kept his price at $25 and put a sign in his window that said, we fix $6 haircuts. And that's what the dentists need to do. In that situation, when they're dealing with that, the person says, I can get it 10000 cheaper if I go to Thailand. Well, what you've got to say to them is, Look, let me give you all the reasons why it's worth investing in us. Firstly, the high quality of equipment and everything we do. Secondly, if anything goes wrong, you are instantaneously going to be fixed and looked after, you know, in those situations. What we really want to sell is the peace of mind that goes with this as well as everything else. Yeah. What happens if something goes wrong two weeks when you're back from Thailand? What are you going to do, run back You want to sell the value-added services, not necessarily the core product, because if all you're selling is implants, and by the end of the day, that's just going to be a price thing. But it's so much more than that if you understand the value-added that go in. What you should be selling in situations like that is obviously peace of mind, you know, rather which is an intangible rather than implants, which is a commodity. So I love the fact that we've got to the point of talking about intangibles so early in our conversation. Because dentistry is really a whole profession based on intangibles. There's all sorts of people coming in with different degrees of comfort or anxiety around you know, dental services. There's different degrees of comfort uh, or anxiety around you know, their smile, their ability to chew, all those other sorts of things. So I wanted to talk to you about the messaging of the intangibles. How do you communicate that effectively? Do you do that on your website? Do you do that in person? How do, Have you seen it done really well in the industries outside of dentistry? And what could dentists learn from those industries? Okay, that is exactly right. Selling it as an intangible, like, for example, to young people in orthodontics, you're selling hope, you know, around there. To people who are in pain, you're selling pain relief. To people who are very anxious, you are selling peace of mind. Absolutely. The way you sell this is communicate the value added. And this is what dentists, in my opinion, do very poorly on their websites. I think what should a dentist's website is not about me, where the dentist talks about him or herself, because the patient really doesn't care that much, right? I don't know why I should use your practice. And things that I think should be on, say, dentist websites are obviously use of experience. Dentists with 30 years' experience should have an advantage over dentists with six months' experience. That's a value added, and people feel comfort like that. Yes. But like range of specializations, range of anesthesia, and things you do to contribute to patient comfort, whether it be washing DVD, watching DVDs or headphones or listening to music, because issues of patient comfort are really important these days. The investment in technology to maximize efficiency and reduce patient discomfort. One of the things I find amazing that dentists don't communicate, and I see it on very few websites, we use the highest level of sterilization for peace of mind of our patients in that area. Now, I know all dentists use high levels of sterilization, but you've got to communicate this because you don't know who's anxious. This is something I find absolutely staggering. And if someone is seeing a current affair where they do stupid stories every once in a while about or safety standards or whatever, and someone's changing a dentist. If you have on your website 
we use the highest level of sterilization. It's another reason for that person to come to you. But even more, system to minimise waiting room time. One of the major reasons people lose is sitting around for two hours. Even if that system is, we will text you, so rather than sitting in our office, you can go shopping next door rather than spending an hour and a half waiting. Things like that, that is about customer service and adding value. Immediate gap refund through high caps, arrangement of finance, convenience of location. What some dentists don't understand is the reason people come to them is because it's easy to park. Yeah. Every dentist says, oh, they come to me because I'm the greatest dentist in the world. No, that's not necessarily true. I'm sure you are the greatest dentist in the world. But at the end of the day, you've got to give people reasons to justify coming to you. And it's got to be about much, much, much more than dentistry. And again, I really, I really like that. And as I was mentioning off air, prior to our conversation in preparation, I was having a look through your website and I came across the nursery and the cafe story. And I'm wondering if you could share that story with our audience. So, because I think there's lots of parallels here that would really translate directly into dentistry. I think one of the, the, when I'm asked about the trend of the future, what I'm saying to, to all businesses is today's core product, and you can call dentistry your audience's core product, today's core product is not tomorrow's core product. Today's value-added service is tomorrow's core product. And by, me, by that I mean we've got to emphasise on that which differentiates us rather than that which makes us the same as every other who's offering the same transaction in the marketplace. And the analogy I gave, and I was doing work in the nursery industry in the 90s, around that time there was a proliferation of cafes open there. Now, a cafe's got nothing to do with a garden centre, right? But why they did it was this. They had one of the, the problems they faced was how do I deal with the non-gardening spouse? Someone will wake up on a Sunday morning and say, ah, oh, darling, let's go to the nursery. And the wife or the husband who's not into gardening would say, boring. So they put a cafe there. So the wife gets two cappuccinos. The husband sends $600 on plants they don't need. And if it wasn't for the cafe, they would never have gone to the nursery, right? Yeah. So what is we need to make the cafe sometimes what we promote to give reasons to say other people they've got to get off their back or to give extra reasons that may have nothing to do with dentistry that would attract people to the practice. For example, IT. Now, I know every kid's got his own smartphone, but the simple element not too long back of a waiting room with Xbox and PlayStation and stuff like that that is kid-friendly or teenager-friendly and stuff like that is an absolute non-product differentiator that gives people a reason to go to one dentist rather than go to another dentist. Yeah. And I think what dentists have to do is stay up. And we were chatting a little bit earlier about the coffee experience or whatever it is there. The issue of the way I am treated from receptionist to dentist, hygienist, whatever, are there, and their ability to build relationships, rapport, and the service they give, I believe is almost as integral to the experience as obviously the quality of the dentistry I'm getting. And I'm challenging dentists, what's the coffee? Do you know what I mean? What's the coffee trying to make you get ahead of your competition? Yeah, it's really interesting, actually, Martin. Literally, as we speak, we are in the process of designing a new surgery for our own practice. And it's funny that you talk about these things because we're paying very deliberate attention to those little things. We're not putting a cafe into our practice, although as much as I love coffee, I would put a cafe into our practice, but space is a bit of a premium. But just as a little thing that we're doing, just it's a simple little thing and it's not the only thing that we're doing, but it's a thing. And that is to make the ability to charge people's phones very easy. People come in all the time and they're asking, do we have phone charges? And so we're setting up a phone charging station for because we, we look after business people more than kids. And so they're all running out of battery life on their iPhone or their Android device. And so very simple thing we're doing is to provide a phone charging station. It's really easy. And yet it just makes their life that little bit more convenient. Yeah, but you know what's important to do? Tell people that. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> Don't let them discover it when they come in the surgery, but it's the kind of thing you put on your website. Things we do to make your life easier. Yeah. To let people know that that is there. One of the greatest strategies I feel is the people who provide the value-added services and don't communicate that to the marketplace and then wonder why it's not appreciated. <laughs> yeah, indeed. Yeah. 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 This is the world's best kept secret. <laughs> Here. I don't think there's any shortage coming up with ideas, and I don't want it any way to this to come across as gimmickry or anything like uh, there in the market. It's a matter of what are the different things that we can do 
to add value that people will appreciate. Now, people will place different values on different things. Like the 75 year old, I really don't give a stuff about your phone charge. Nah. Do you know what I mean? Nah. Do that. It's not going to appeal to everybody, but it will appeal to some people in your marketplace. And it's important we communicate it to everybody so the people in our marketplace will understand it's evaluated. Yeah, absolutely. And I guess one of the questions I really wanted to ask you, Martin, because again, you've been talking about this subject for so long. What is it that surprises you most in today's world when it comes to customer service? What never ceases to surprise you? Okay, it falls into two areas. One, a little bit like what we're talking about. It's like people provide a lot of evaluated services and never tell their clients. Yeah. And then, and then the, the thing that happens is the person who provides all the evaluated services ends up matching price with the person who doesn't provide the evaluated services, and then they educate their marketplace that the evaluated services are worth nothing. Yes. Right? Um, invariably do this exercise where I actually get people to brainstorm all the non-price value adders mm-hmm. that are involved in their business and they'll come up with 20 value adders, right? And I'll say, okay, good. Go talk to a couple of your customers and ask them all the value added services you provide and the customer comes up with two or three, which means if I'm aware of 20, and my customers are aware of three, and I don't start telling you about the other 17, I'm going to lose you as soon as my competitor undercuts me. So that issue of the communication of the value-added services that are already provided is one of the things that I find amazingly weak. The other is the human interaction. You know, my perception of the business is whoever I come in contact with, and if your receptionist has just broken up with a boyfriend and she's angry and she takes it out on the patients, that reflects as badly on your business as you providing poor dentistry out there. So the issue as far as staff is concerned, firstly, you can train skills, but you can't train attitude. What you don't want are staff with 20 years of experience of being grumpy. What you want is people who have a good attitude who can be trained. Now, I'm not talking about in the dental area, but receptionists, and you know, when you're talking about hygienists, anyone who has customer contact, what you want to do is you want to get nice people and train them how to be good in that area rather than just looking for people who've got a lot of experience who may irritate your patients. And this is the thing that I find very much under that. We hire people terribly. We just hire people to fill a spot, whatever is there, and then we wonder why our business struggles when that person doesn't give a bam about our business the way we do. Yeah. Ladies and gents, if you've just joined us, I'm having a conversation with Martin Grunstein, and he is an expert when it comes to customer service and helping people and businesses differentiate themselves in the competitive and crowded marketplace. You can find Martin's website at martingrunstein.com.au. Martin, I wanted to talk to you a little bit about hearts and minds versus arms and legs. Uh, It's a conversation I've had a few times over the last year or so, and it feels to me, just going back to the conversation we had a moment ago about recruiting poorly, sometimes it feels like we recruit people for labor rather than engagement. So when it comes to hiring people with a good attitude, how do you actually test that attitude? How do you know that you've got a gem versus someone who's just showing up well in an interview? Okay, I think the the simplest way is we have some sort of intuition just as as human beings in that area. I say the best thing, and there are so many politically incorrect things you can't ask in interviews that are not going to reveal these sort of things, right? Absolutely. The best thing you can do in an interview is just get people to talk about themselves, right? Mm -hmm. A thing like in a couple of minutes you'll pick up a vibe. Yeah. In terms of whether they're what sort of people they are and ask them things there. And the most important thing is you want someone – who has a good attitude and reflects your positive attitude that's going to be reflected in the marketplace. There's two things that I try and get across in customer service that are myths out there. One, firstly, the customer is always right, which is absolute rubbish. The customer's wrong most of the time, but they have to walk away thinking they're right. Yeah, yep. Difference to, to that. The other along those lines is, is to provide quality customer service. We need to give up the need to be right for the greater good of the client relationship, right? Now, when... Patients are wrong, and patients, if they knew everything, would be dentists for heaven's sake. Do you know what I mean? So they don't, they don't know as much about what's going on. They might have feelings or opinions or anything like that. But our job is to give up the need to be right for that thing. You don't have to prove. If your patient comes in and says something stupid or does something wrong, the challenge is to empathise and preserve their ego. Mm. Right? Say you're wrong and I'm right. Yep. Which, and those are the things that cause people to leave practices. Dentists themselves, for heaven's sake, just in their conversation can sometimes do more damage to their practices 
than anything by just telling that person their football team's stupid or I don't believe in your religion or whatever stupid stuff people talk about there. I believe that patter is just as much as important to the customer service provider for for their practice. I have a perfect example. I was out with my wife and another couple at a restaurant and we ordered uh, dinner and I ordered a Coke. Yep. And the waiter says, we don't have Coke, we have Pepsi. And I said, that's fine. And I was telling my friends, I said, I remember from old marketing days that Pepsi used to beat Coke on blind product taste and most people couldn't tell the difference anyway. And the waiter said to me, that may have been the case in the past, sir, but in the last 10 years, Pepsi beats Coke and many people can't tell the difference. That's not his job. Do you know what I mean? Didn't need to say it, did he? What I'm saying is, I don't blame the waiter. He just wasn't trained in customer service. Yeah. His job is not to prove me wrong. His job is to enhance my experience at the restaurant. And that's more important than the meal. Now we joke about it. We never went back to the restaurant and whatever. And the restaurant could have had fantastic food. And I'm saying in the area of any customer service, whether it be dentistry or any other business at all, your job, if you are selling the intangible, is to help that person come into the surgery from the moment they book online or ring up or whatever it happens to be to the moment they walk out with their dignity, their ego preserved and making them feel as good about themselves as you possibly can. The only time right or wrong is extremely important is in a court of law yeah. where you have a disagreement over what is the right action to take. Okay, then as a dentist, you have to do ethically what's right in that area. But our job is to make them feel walk away with it having had a positive as positive experience as they can I appreciate it's not always a positive experience but that's the more important issue than getting things right and wrong absolutely and you look I have to endorse that 100 percent Martin because when I was a younger man I learned a lot uh, in the space of selling and marketing through network marketing and uh, my mentor at the time used to say to me because I could be a little bit what's the word I had a need to be right at some points as a younger man. And my mentor at the time said to me, you know, Jesse, you've got to learn that you can be right or you can be rich, but you can't always be both, mate. And so I have learned to smile and nod a lot. And it's amazing how I can wish someone's footy team really well when I'm hoping they get slaughtered. But it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter because it's important for them, for their team to do well. So I'm happy for them that their team does well. But would I barrack for them myself? Absolutely not. But if Martin's a, a Carlton supporter and I'm a Collingwood supporter and you know, Carlton gets one up over Collingwood, well, good for Martin, you know, but, and I'm happy for you. And that's great. Well, the, you see, the interesting thing, the rules in customer service are very simple. You give up ego for money. That's what the rules of customer service are. Absolutely, you know? yeah. Uh, so when that area, and also understand when people have their ego scratched, they want to take revenge, right? Yeah. Now, the interesting thing we have to understand in a professional relationship, and a lot of professionals don't get that because even though they've been with their patients a long time, they sort of treat them as equals and they're not equals. The rules are if you're giving me money as a dental patient, I, I still have to preserve your ego all the time, but you don't necessarily have to preserve mine. That's just the essence of the inequality of the relationship there. And I have heard people damage great relationships because of saying something stupid after the 27th beer. Do you, do you know what I mean? This is just absolutely ridiculous. Yeah. And I suggest to dentists, now the difference is if it's a friend who becomes a patient, that's different from if it's a patient who becomes a friend. Because if there's a friend, if you're friends before there's an equity in the relationship, right? Yep. But if you're a patient and the patient leads to a friendship, you, see them, you know, out, you still have to be on guard and you can't crush egos and you can't be 100% honest all the time. Otherwise, you will lose the professional side of that relationship. Absolutely. And in the work that I do these days in the consulting space as well, I mean, it's exactly the same. Many of my clients are good friends, but I have to be conscious of what I say, where I say it and how I do it. And dentists absolutely need to be in the same boat. Uh, I've seen many situations unravel where as you say after the 27th beer they've said something that didn't quite land the way they had thought it would and the whole thing's dissolved into a screaming heap i wanted to talk a moment about complaints because if you've been in business long enough there'll be times when you do make a mistake and you know maybe it is after the 27th beer that you've said something how do you mend a relationship how do you get that love back Okay. People want three things when they're complaining. One, they want to winch, let them winch. Two, they want acknowledgement of their inconvenience. Mm. And this is where people get it wrong. Until you acknowledge my inconvenience, I'm not listening to a word you say, right? 
Uh, and then they want to know what you can do, not what you can't do, right? So the issue in uh, things like that, a lot, when, a, when a complaint, especially in an area of dentist where the person comes in and says, oh, I'm in pain, and you said I wouldn't be in pain, or whatever the complaint happens to be, it's very interesting. Our response as human beings, psychologically, we are so hardwired to not admit we are wrong. It's basically innate. Let me give you an example. I say at seminars to people, how many people are parents of kids three and above? And if they are, I say, okay, cast your mind back to when your child was two years old and they're drawing with crayons on the wall and you catch them in the act, right? The crayons in their hand, there's crap on the wall yep. and you see them. Doing it. Yep. And you say to the child, who did that? Well, what does your child say? Not me, mummy. Do you know what I mean? That, and, and the psychologists say the younger your child is when they start to lie, the more intelligent they are. This is innate and built into us as human beings, yeah, right? Yeah. Now, what happens is that two-year-old toddler becomes a 40-year-old dentist, yep. right? And the patient comes in and says, oh, that really hurts. I think you stuffed up there. There's something wrong. Now, we can't say not me, mummy. We replace that lying with, we defend our professionalism, mm. right? I've been doing this 20 years. Every once in a while, that's something that happens, you know, to do that. And that's what we've got to stop doing uh, out there in, in a complaint situation. I'm not interested in you defending your professionalism. I want you to acknowledge my inconvenience and empathize with me and tell me what we can do to get it right. Yeah. Now, the only time, now, the reason people do this, and I appreciate there are legal implications. When you say to someone, and this is something I think all dentists should say, and not just dentists, all customer service here, and when someone says to you, I'm in pain, this is awful, the response should be, I am terribly sorry to hear that. Yeah. It's not a legal admission of liability in a court of law. It's an empathy statement. When someone says to you, I'm in pain, I've got an adverse outcome, but goodness me, I am so sorry to hear that. I'm sorry for the inconvenience we're going through. Let's see what we can do about it. And there is such a fear of saying, I'm sorry, in the marketplace, and I think in healthcare professionals, it's even more important. That patient wants empathy mm. in that situation and an understanding. Now, they may have abused themselves and done something wrong that's caused that, but firstly, they're never going to admit that to you anyway. <laughs> you know, so there is no point in trying to prove them wrong in that area. Yep. The analogy I give is if you go to a funeral and you go to the breed and you say, I'm terribly sorry for your loss, that is saying to them, I understand how you feel. You're not admitting to murdering the deceased. No. <laughs> Do you no. know what I mean? So you say, I'm sorry, it didn't mean I killed that person. I understand how you feel, and I'm trying to give you some empathy in that area. Yep. And I think we have to understand this as, as customer service professionals. When someone comes us to a complaint, we need to acknowledge their inconvenience. Only then will they have a chance of of, of recovering. If you're covering your ass all the time, there will be no communication there, and eventually they'll take the business area, they'll business elsewhere because they can't save face and do business with you. Yeah, and equally, Martin, I think if you do handle that complaint well, those patients, if you do show empathy and you do make it right for them, those patients can become really loyal advocates. Has that been your experience as well? Absolutely. Interestingly enough, uh, it can actually lead to positive referral business. Yeah. I think a lot of people have such low expectations in the way they're dealt with that when they do deal with someone who treats them with dignity and respect and, and tries to consider their needs rather than covering their own backside, uh, it's, it's word of mouth. Uh, I was doing work in the in the lighting industry and a company had the policy that if ever a delivery didn't arrive on time by truck, they'd air freight it the next day. Now, you lose all the profit on the job once you do that. So we trained the customer service people so that when a customer would complain, the first thing we do is, look, I'm terribly sorry for your inconvenience. What can we do to put it right? 80% of them didn't need it air freighted. You know, their deadlines weren't that tight. We'd put it on the next road train. Yeah. But we always put it on the road train and it was accompanied with a little note and a bottle of wine saying, I'm sorry we let you down. I mean, I appreciate how valuable this is to you. They actually got word of mouth referrals from their stuff ups because their competitor didn't do that. So how they dealt with the stuff up and the complaint actually became a point of differentiation that got them word of mouth in the marketplace and they were getting people away from their competitor because of how poorly the competitor handled the complaint. Yeah, really interesting on that, just as a small little story. Some years ago, we were renovating a house in Brisbane and we'd been to pick out the bath and the tapware, you know, the usual bits and pieces that go in a bathroom. And this particular bathroom supplier, uh, Christian's, very, very good. We got to the house after work one day and we we're meant to go and see our brand new bathroom. And of course, the wrong taps were installed. Now, these taps came up through the floor. 
And the reason I bring this up, Martin, is for them to replace the taps, which they did at no cost to us, they had to pull up the tiles. They had to take out the waterproofing. They had to re-waterproof, re-plumb, you know, re-tile, and then put the right taps in. And not a cent from us. And when we came back a week later or a few days later, I can't remember how long it was, it was perfect. Like, not not a blip, nothing wrong. Now, I'm pretty sure they made no money on that deal just because of the fact they had to pay the plumber and the tiler and whoever else to get it right. But I can also guarantee I have referred, I don't know, at least 30 people to that business. Mm-hmm. Because they just did it so elegantly and so well without a grizzle, without a gripe. But if you understand from a customer service potential, firstly, if you were to sue them, they would have had to do it anyway. Yep. But all the consumer law is in favour of the consumer. Yep. So instead of doing it reluctantly, they did it proactively and positively, right? Yep. Cost them the same whether they did it reluctantly or, or proactive positively. But by doing it proactively and positively and treating you with respect and dignity, they get the 30 referrals they would never have got if they would have had to do it when they went through the courts. Yeah. Now, to me, that is nothing more than common sense. That's not rocket science. The fact that it is so impressive in your mind is it's very rare. Yes. You know, and that's the problem. Yes. People don't want to do it wrong. They want to cover their ass. They want to save the thing. But what they don't realize is they're doing themselves more damage because when they make you feel bad through that, you are thinking of giving negative referrals. And if they did the right thing, you give them 30 positive referrals. From a business model point of view, it just it doesn't get any more intelligent than that. No. So why is it so infrequent and in common? Because what we're talking about today, everything is profound, but it's not rocket science, right? We're not splitting atoms here. So why is it so uncommon? Why is good service so uncommon? Is it because people can't be bothered? or Look, people don't want to give up the need to be right. You know, what you were saying as a young dentist, you know, in that area mm. – this is innate, you know, as I say, from toddler to adult. We don't admit we are wrong we are, or we want to cover our ass or, or anything like that. This is a natural human thing. But if you are in the customer service business, you give up the need to be right for the greater good of the relationship. The fact that the standards are low out there just means the return on investment is greater for the people who do it willingly and with a good heart. Yeah. <laughs> These are the, and you know what? It's not unique to business. I say to my clients, I said, hey, as a parent, if you embarrass your children when they're six, they won't talk to you when they're teenagers. Yeah. That's the way they get there. This is a human thing. It's not a business thing. Mm. But I'm saying in the business environment, why it's so bad is this need to be right is always becomes an argument. People, unless they are trained in this area, don't understand that giving up the need to be right doesn't mean you're weaker. Sometimes it's going to cost you money, but the return on investment is the positive goodwill of your customers' patience, and that will bring your business back many times over. Now, the people who come on referral for these wonderful things are not price sensitive. Yeah, and it all ties back into that, doesn't it? So I've got a question for you. Let's um, let's hypothetically assume that... Um, yeah, you could go back in time and you've done your dental degree and you're opening a practice. What are the two or three things that you would really focus on in your practice if you were a dentist to help you be successful commercially uh, and have a fulfilling life while you're at an you know, enjoyable professional experience for yourself and for the patient? What would you be focusing on as we wrap this up? Okay. Uh, let me look at two areas. One, dentists have to understand their income's got almost nothing to do with their technical skills. Yeah. Their income's their people skills and their marketing skills, and the best dentists don't make the most money, and there's some crappy dentists making a lot of money and really brilliant dentists making no money at all. Right? So, Amen uh, to that. Yeah. So what happens is, okay, you've been absolutely competently trained as a technical professional as you come into the area, but if you understand that your business success is going to be a function of the way you treat people, learn this stuff. Do you know what I mean? Don't don't spend all your money getting a chair that costs seventeen thousand dollars and not spend five dollars in your own personal development in terms of that area. And I don't mean going to the American rah rah business seminars. Work out how your how people think you are a customer service professional, whether you like it or not. If you choose dentistry, do you know in that area? Yep. Other area, and this is the thing I find absolutely amazing: uh, the post sale. 
retention of patients. What are you doing? Let me give you an example. I play golf with a few people older than me. One of the guys had a knee replacement. So he was off golf for a while and he had a barbecue for his mates on a Sunday afternoon. This is 10 days after the uh, surgery. Yep. So 2.30 Sunday afternoon, 10 days after the surgery, he gets a phone call from the orthopedic surgeon just to see how he's recovering, right? Yep. Now, uh, that orthopedic surgeon picked up two hips and a knee from the people <laughs> at the party because that's the kind of doctor I want who actually rings up and sees, am I going okay around there? And I think dentists have a lot to learn from this, not, not uniquely dentists have a lot to learn. I believe when I'm working with dentists, I say this is it, there are two people who require phone calls from you to follow up and make sure they're okay. One, major cases yes. and panicky parents. Do you know what I mean? Because panicky parents have big influence amongst other parents, you know, around there. So if you ring up and say, we go, Johnny, I just want to make sure he's okay and stuff like that, you will get more word of mouth around through all the playgroup, you know, to do that. Yeah. Uh, the other thing, what should happen there is, okay, I believe apart from the serious cases in the panicky parents, it's nice if the receptionist rings just want to make sure everything went okay, do, do you know, to, uh, to not for checkups, but for anything that's of any thing like that. We were just concerned just to do that because you want to convey some sort of caring uh, out there. Now, the simplest rule, and I learned this, I was doing a seminar in the, in the 90s for an IT company and the lady told me a great story. She said she was test driving a Lexus while test driving the car. The salesperson asked her a lot of questions. One of them was, what type of music do you like? She didn't give it any thought till she took delivery of the car and sitting on the front seat of the car were $200 worth of CDs in her favourite music. Oh, wow. It, yeah, well, it was six months after she bought the car that we did the workshop. And I said to her, how many people you told about the CDs in the last six months? She said, oh, about 100. I said, how many people you told about the car? She said, gee, no one initially, but every person I told about the CDs wanted to know what car it was. And I told 100 people how happy I was with my Lexus and where I bought it. And what I say to dentists, so what are the CDs of the Lexus? Yeah. The CDs of the Lexus is not doing great dentistry, crown work, whatever it is. That's not the CDs. That's the core product. Yeah. The CDs is the phone call afterwards. Do you know what I mean? Just to see that I got better, that you cared, or just even a little thank you. Or th those, those are the things that are done that are in re re repair and business. Yeah, I say to my clients, well, why don't you have a free Melbourne Cup sweep and give your best patients a ticket in the, the sweep? Just free. Just want to say thank you for my top patients. Yeah, look, there are a million things we can do. Absolutely. You know, it's, bounded by your, it's bounded by your imagination out there. But the advice I have to dentists is this is an important area. And I'm not saying dentists have to be money-focused or anything like that. I believe they're entitled to a decent income. But please don't spend all your time, money, and efforts on the technical side of your business and then wonder why you are being beaten in the marketplace by people who are actually business professionals. Yeah, absolute gold. Ladies and gents, if you've been listening to our podcast, I'm going to encourage you to go back for the last three or four minutes and just play that last bit over and over and over because it's solid gold. It's it's absolute magic. And and Martin, one of the things you spoke about there was retention and regular listeners to this podcast will know that retention is a subject very near and dear to my heart. I believe that retention is the most overlooked uh, part of a marketing plan. I believe that you know, people waste hundreds, thousands, tens of thousands of dollars trying to attract more patients when they could really just be focusing on hanging on to the ones that they've got. And so, Martin, just really quickly, I know you've been incredibly generous with your time, so I don't want to impose on you too much, but I would love your thoughts on the value of customer retention. Yeah, look, to me, it's uh, look, you and I share an opinion in that area. Why would you spend a dollar on new customers when you've got existing customers to do that? I actually say in the business environment, I say to my clients, look at your marketing budget if you're a small to medium sized business. Why don't you, I think you should cut your promotional budget in half, take half of that again and have a holiday, and spend 25% of your previous marketing budget on CDs of the Lexus and recognizing your existing client yeah. base. Do you area. The feedback I have is people very rarely go back. If they do that effectively, they very rarely have the need to increase their advertising. Yeah. The hardest thing is to start a practice. I appreciate that there's no shortcuts. It's very hard. But if you've been in a practice for five years and you've built up a base, you should not need to spend a lot of money on marketing if you understand the simple metaphor of the CDs with the Lexus in terms of adding value to your existing clients. Again, the ones who come on referral for the CDs are not price sensitive. The ones who come for the special offer are price sensitive by definition. So I think you and I feel the simple way. What I try and do in my business is give people ideas of CDs or give people ideas of reasons why that they can apply to their business. And once they get the mentality right, everything is simple.
Uh, Martin, that is absolute gold. Martin, thank you so much for taking the time out of your day to hang with us. Everything you've spoken about over the last you know, 45 to 50 minutes has been absolutely uh, solid gold. And I know that the ladies and gents who are listening to this podcast, probably on their way to work, are going to be madly going back to take some notes because everything you've said today is practical, it's actionable, and I really want to thank you so much for making it so relevant to our audience. You're an absolute wizard. You're a generous, kind soul. And from all of us here, uh, thank you so very much for hanging out with us. It's been a great pleasure. And as I say, if any of the dentists want to contact me, uh, just get me through the, through the website. The simple things I can do for them is help them with this area. At the end of the day, your clients judge you on your results, not your intentions. So we've got to make these things happen in the marketplace. Uh, my, it's been a great place. I'd be happy to chat to you again any time, Jesse. This for me is fun. Uh, it's absolutely fun. Ladies and gents, please do head across to Martin's website, martingrunstein.com.au. There is a treasure trove of goodies there. As I said to you, I got lost in the YouTube channel. There's so many good bits of information there, solid gold. And I'd really encourage you to seek Martin now because everything he says, as I mentioned, is not just good sense. It's practical and it's actually and it makes a real difference. So once again, Martin, thank you so much, mate. My pleasure. Thank you for listening to the Savvy Dentist Podcast with Dr. Jesse Green. For more free tools and resources, join the free Facebook group. Visit drjessegreen.com slash Facebook. And for more episodes, visit drjessegreen.com slash Savvy Dentist.